All right, good morning. I think we're seeing something at the bottom there, I hope. All right, my name is Michael Webster. I carry Bob Meloshenko's briefcase. It's the way I introduce myself at work. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you'll be with us today, that your spirit will be with us to guide us, to enlighten us, and most of all, to show us more of your character. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I'm going to talk about something that is probably going to offend some people and maybe not. Some of you that are settled in your beliefs, I don't think you'll have a problem with this. The problem that we get into in discussions about origins or things like that is that the minute you start questioning what somebody believes in, it now becomes personal. And people start to get offended. And that is not my intention to offend anybody today. I just want to ask some questions. So this is lecture six. And if the slides will go forward, we'll be in business. The title today is Origins and what we considered settled science. In other words, that word means evidence is there, we're all okay, everybody understands this, everybody believes this. Go ahead and print it. Nobody will read it anyway. This quote is attributed to Alan Dulles. Some of you know him, some of you are too young to know him. See an ex-CIA director that was on the Warren Commission. He was fired by Kennedy. And this quote is attributed to him by Hale Boggs, who was also on the Warren Commission, regarding the release of this thing. He said, Americans don't read. Do you agree with that? I'm seeing some nods. This is frightening. I don't know if you can see those statistics. This is from the Bureau. I went to look. I went to look. Is this a true statement? I'm going to tell you something. Every time somebody makes a statement, if you go and verify that, it's a very enlightening experience. Okay? So I went to the website, Bureau of Labor Statistics. The average hours per day spent in leisure and sports time activity, 2012 figures. All right? You can get this on the website. And notice we're men and women, and then it even goes into certain age groups. What do you suppose watching TV? How many hours per day do you watch TV? Or does the general public watch TV? Well, men are bad, especially on the weekends. And then it goes down through there. There's, it divides them into weekdays and weekends. And as you can see, the age groups now, 75 years or older, that's a lot of free time. Well, let's go look at reading. Now, that's 0.17 of an hour. And on the weekends, it gets a wee bit better. This is the most shocking one coming up next, okay? Relaxing or thinking. Now, on the weekends, we think 20 minutes. And I don't want any male to boast that they think a little bit more than females just because it's point three there. Do you see that? Was Alan Dulles' statement correct? Appears it is. We've got some evidence. This question was asked in a Sabbath school class in an Adventist church. Does the SDA church spread a tent large enough to include me? It was asked by the Sabbath school director. Okay, I'm going to give you some background. This actually happened. So this gentleman is up there. He's leading the Sabbath school in a discussion. And he wants to know if the church is big enough to accept him. He's a proponent of science. 
an advocate of the scientific method. That means theory comes up, you validate it with information, make your judgments according to what you find. He subscribes to the verifiable facts. I have that in quotations because that's the quote that was used. And then we're going to look. The verifiable facts of evolution. Okay? Now, on the surface of that, if you're a young mind searching, you're in trouble. He feels that he shouldn't be discriminated against because of his view on evolution. And what's wrong with the rest of us? Are we naive or ignorant, narrow-minded, exclusionary, because some of us don't buy the verifiable facts of evolution? He affirms that he believes in God and Christ. I'm painting the picture for you on what we're going to look at, okay? This is his opinion and where he's coming from. Don't we worship the same God? We believe in the same Savior. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, the tent should be big enough to include him and others of like beliefs. That was his statement. Is this a true assessment? So I'm going to ask you this question today. If we have differing beliefs on how we got here, that's the word origins, is it a significant issue in this entire scope of sin and salvation? Does it make any difference? Do we not worship the same God? How many of you think it's the same God, whether we buy science's explanation or the biblical explanation? How many of you think it's the same God? Somebody's shaking their head. I, I, we're getting there. I like this. Does it really matter how we got here? And aren't origin debates divisive and distractive from what's really issue we should be going forward. Is it a big deal? Is this a reasonable argument? Is what this Sabbath school teacher is saying reasonable? How do you decide how you engage him? Has he made correct statements? Well, luckily, we have some evidence. We're instructed to be open-minded, agreed? We're instructed to be tolerant, and especially with fellow believers. So let's look at these definitions. If there's something we need to define, it's what's this. What's open-minded? Receptive to new and different ideas or the opinions of others. He certainly qualifies for one of these, doesn't he? Or a couple of them. He's got a different idea on how, we, and it's certainly a different opinion. Should we tolerate this? What's the difference between open-mindedness and gullibility? Gullibility, the tendency to believe too readily and therefore to be easily deceived. Now, there's a word in there that you and I cringe at as Adventists every time we see it, right? What's that word? Deceived. So now, how do we proceed in this? How do we assess this problem? To be open-minded and to accept his views or agree with him? Wonderful. Fellowship. Okay. I like that. And your answer was that to be open-minded means you're willing to listen to somebody else's opinion. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to adapt it. Okay? 
so how I, and gullibility means you accept everything. I like that, and that's what this is saying: too readily, too easy to accept. So now, what I want to get is how do we sort this out? Do we have any guidelines? We do have guidelines. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. You know what I'm going to read, don't you? Who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Would you consider them open-minded? And searched the scriptures daily whether those things were true. So what is Acts the book of Acts and Luke telling us to do here. As Christians, what should we do? Excellent. So that's our guideline. That's how we're going to proceed. Agreed? Here's the problem. We need to ask serious questions in order to proceed. Okay? Serious questions should be asked of those who incorporate evolutionary science with the Bible. Are they compatible? Let's ask some questions, and that's what we're going to do today. Because the answers that we get can impact the basic Christian beliefs that we hold in this church. And we're going to deal with some categories here, such as the origin of death. How do we differ in the origin of death? How do we differ in the origin of sin? Are these not basic concepts in the church? God's creative power, resurrection, and free will. All right? So let's start. We're going to go down here. Okay. Origin of death. What does the Bible say? Has it always been present or is it acquired? In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the unto the ground for out of it wast thou taken for dust art thou or thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. This was stated where? After Bob showed you the eating of the fruit, right? He showed you what they got inoculated with in our belief. This is the result of that. They're going to die. So the Bible has a different opinion of how death started. It entered as a result of sin, correct? The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15.26 In the biblical view, sin is the result of something, but it is an enemy to God and to us. That's the biblical explanation for it. Agreed? Biblically, death is never a positive event. It is always portrayed as the ultimate negative end. And Bob went over some of this in Lecture 3, where we showed you how cells die. Is there any evidence that we weren't designed to die? And what we're going to do for two short slides is look at the scientific evidence. What we find as their current understanding of why we age and die is because cells don't function perfectly. There's imperfectness in the system. And this comes from some of the information system, the DNA hacking that we've talked about. This cut and paste mechanism that goes on causes mutations, it causes imperfect proteins to be formed. The housekeeping genes, if you want to consider it that way, don't work perfectly. So what happens though is that the organism builds up this stuff and ultimately starts to disintegrate. And if you have a cell that does that and mold, the cells start to do that, you start to do that. But notice what these guys say in here. The imperfectness model suggests that some organisms, even animals, may theoretically be immortal. So even the evolutionists are saying there's some sign in here that you shouldn't have to die if these things work properly. So the hints that we were not meant to die are there. And notice one other thing that they say here. By balancing damage by cell division or replacement of old cells with new cells. Bob's talked about stem cells. 
we now know that all tissues in our body have stem cells like replacements on a football team waiting on the sidelines to take the place of someone that's injured. If those cells take the place of injured cells, we're good to go. But the problem as we age, these stem cells, these replacement players, get worn out also because they've got imperfect. In a perfect system, we're good. And Bob showed you, according to this diagram, this is just a review of lecture three, that as cells start to build up this garbage, this yellow repair system here in the middle, the, the cell gets sent. There's checkpoint systems in a cell. The cell gets said or is told, stop, don't divide anymore. Let's sort this problem out. If the problem can't be sorted out, then the cell is sent into further shutdown. Okay? If it's repaired, guess what? Back into the entry cell cycle system. Okay, you're allowed to divide. Everything's fine. Off you go. But one of the things that we find repeatedly as we age and die, and this, I want to circle this yellow one here, and then this rose-colored one, and then ultimately the one at the bottom. The yellow one is an enzyme that silences mobile elements that we've talked about. It decreases as you get older or as the cell starts to go into senescence. Then this locking up mechanism that you see here in the DNA methylation gets less. So now you've got imperfect enzymes that are silencing these parasites not working properly, or think of it in terms of we don't have enough straight jackets for the inmates. Okay? Pretty soon the inmates are getting loose. And then what happens here at the bottom, the inmates are in charge of the asylum. We're done. Shut the institution down. So we've shown you that there's some evidence, even in the scientific literature, that sin, what we're calling sin, causes death. And it does it by genetic changes. Let's look at the other side. To be fair, we've got to look at everybody's side. We've just looked at the biblical side on how sin causes death. What about evolution? How do you get evolution without death? You can't. It's the pruning shears. It cuts off the weak, random genetic formations that aren't successful, aren't the strongest, haven't adapted the best, right? If their line or branch gets trimmed, we just get the strongest stuff coming up, and ultimately we get a tree of evolution, correct? It ultimately, according to their point of view, allowed us to walk upright, acquire conscious brains that can think, because our primate cousins can't do that as far as we understand, and emerge atop the kingdom of animals. You heard of that phrase, the ascent of man? Well. According to them, anyway, we still had to descend because we had to come out of the trees, right? Just for a moment before we walked upright. The point I'm trying to make here is death got us here. According to the evolutionary theory, death got us here. No death, we don't evolve. No changes occur. No weak genetic lines get weeded out. What does this say now, these two differing views say, about a God that either used evolution or used creation? What does that say? Is there a difference? Do we worship the same God? The creation God says it came as a result of sin. And it's an enemy to him and his creation. And it's the ultimate one that's going to get destroy, the ultimate enemy. What does an evolution god say? It's necessary. It's my pruning shears. It's how I got you here. I have a question. If that's the pruning shears you're using, why would you call it an enemy?
For an evolutionary God to say that death is the last enemy to be destroyed is at best, let's be, let's be technical here, it's disingenuous. You agree? You can't have 1 Corinthians 15 and then say it's necessary for how I got you here. If God isn't being truthful in that area, you know where I'm going with this one, don't you? We can ask other questions. Does sin really cause death? Is eternal life really eternal? Is heaven really like you say it is? No pain, no death. Once you start bringing the character of God into question with what he says or his, even his revelation to us, is death really destroyed? Maybe, what if he decides to use it in another time in the future to create another world? How truthful and trustworthy is God in how, what he tells us about himself? Is this model or this examination of the, just the simple item of death, is that raising questions for you? And let's be honest. If you're employing a little literary sleight of hand and saying, well, he, Paul is just being allegorical here. He doesn't really mean it's an enemy. Because we've all heard that defense. How's that going to whitewash to all those believers that have died believing that death was the enemy? How's God going to explain that to them? Does God really mean what he says? We're, we're, are you flashing back to last week's talk? Isn't that the very same thing that was used to get negotiations going about what we ingested at the tree? Where have we heard that question before, huh? All right. Enough of death. Let's go to the origin of sin. How do, how do the two differ in the origin of sin? The biblical account of sin can be found in Genesis 3. We talked about it last week. We talked about the whole story of how sin arose. We also know that it's genetically transmitted. Because for one man to have sinned and, and sin enter the world and death by sin, so death passed to all men. The only way we can explain that is it has to be something in the genetics. And there's some evidence for this in Psalms. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The Bible's telling us you're born this way. According to the biblical view, sin and death were passed from the first pair to their offspring as an inherited genetic condition or tendency. You agree with that? For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So it came in to your genetics by one man, but one man's got the solution to the genetic problem. Correct? Let's look at the other side. How do they explain the problem of sin? How can, and half the people that believe, or no, let me, get, let me back that up. Probably 90% of the belief, the people that believe in evolution, this is not an issue for them. Sin is not a problem. There's no debate about sin. At what point, you have to ask this, at what point in the evolutionary process did humans acquire the capacity to function on a moral level and be accountable? See, the word that they use is, after we diverged from the apes or the monkeys, at what point did we become smart enough so that God could say, okay, now we need to, now we need to talk. He has to do something. He has to at least lay the ground rules because to be called merciful, compassionate, or righteous, you can't do that without explaining the rules, right? Everybody agree with that? 
So maybe the conversation went like this. Okay, guys, he gathers the whatever it is, uh, probably just a little bit before Neanderthals, I would guess, sits the troops down and says, okay, I've got good news and bad news. Good news, congratulations. You've risen to the top of the tree. All right? You have, you're the lucky winners or the strongest winners. You've successfully used those traits and adapted the most advanced traits of all the living organisms that have existed, and now you are at the top. Now I'm going to come and chat with you, and we're going to have a talk, right? This is theoretical conversation that would have had to have taken place at some point. Here's the bad news. Now that you've honed these attributes to their highest, you've got to stop using them. No more survival of the fittest. No more strongest. No more saving yourself at everybody's expense. I'm changing the rules on you. That self-preserving behavior that allowed you to transmit your genetics on to your children has now got to stop. Is this making sense? But maybe you acquired the idea that being altruistic was helpful. In other words, your clan worked together to preserve your genetic material so it could get passed on. But I'm going to take it to another level, God says, right? You got to put your other fellow human beings first. You got to become a servant to all, not only to the stranger, story of the Good Samaritan, but to your enemies at well as well, the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? So we can all understand preserving our own clan, but now he's saying, I want you to preserve your enemy's genetic material at the expense of your own. So now that you've gotten here, I'm changing the rules on you, 180 degrees. I now want you to lay down your life for your fellow man, even your enemies. Is this making sense? The process that God utilized to create by natural selection, which is what the evolutionary model says, would have selected behavior afterwards labeled as sin. Is that correct? This sin uh, would not be any small matter because it's punishable by death. And not just any death, but a grim lake of fire. Oof. Let me ask you a question. Is the evolutionary God different than the creation God? Are you seeing any differences? These are the questions we're asking this individual who says the Adventist church, is the Adventist church spread a tent? Does it spread a tent large enough to include us? Who would be responsible for sin in this evolutionary scenario? Correct. You wouldn't need an adversary, would you? Because the traits that you selected or encouraged that made you rise to the top of the tree are now the ones that are God alone, via the natural selection process, would have fostered the ingrained tendencies to act selfishly. You agree with this? Do you need to have an adversary? Once again, what is this saying about the character of God? Is God blaming someone else, real or fictional, for what he, in fact, himself has done? I'll take the, take the blame off myself. I'll make up this imaginary adversary. Who would want to have anything more to do with him, much less seek him to correct the problem? How could anyone ever trust him again about anything if the very characteristics that you selected to rise to the top of the tree, now the rules get changed on you? In the natural selection model, the assembly line output is loaded with unacceptable or undesirable traits, totally devoid of the virtues that God ultimately wants. Is that the best he can do? The 
high priest of evolution, Richard Dawkins, when he was asked about theistic evolution, that's the combination of the Bible and evolution. People say, well, Genesis is kind of a myth. It's Everybody has myths in their backgrounds, and that's ours. So we believe science, God created through evolution. This is what Richard Dawkins says, okay? I find this a pathetic argument. For one thing, if I were God wanting to make a human being, I would do it by a more direct way rather than by evolution. I find that ironic. Why deliberately set it up in the one way which makes it look as though you didn't exist, right? It seems remarkably a remarkably roundabout way, not to say a deceptive way of doing things. All right, we've dealt with two issues. Let's go on to God's creative power, all right? And we're going to look at it from certain points of view and then look at it from the evolutionary point of view. Here's the creation God in Revelation 21, 4 to 5. And recognize, I understand that we've already been fixed when this statement occurs, okay? And God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, What? Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He's given his signet ring to this one. So, if you look at this carefully, I've underlined the most important pivot point in this whole thing. If God says, I can make all things new, and at He's prefaced that beforehand by saying there will be no more death. He's obviously able, at, let's take ourselves out of the equation, he's obviously able to make plants, animals, without going through evolution, correct? If an evolutionary god has the ability to create multiple and varied forms of life without the use of randomness and death at the end of time why didn't he use the same method at the beginning why would he opt for billions of years of suffering and death of his creatures on an unimaginable scale when he could have avoided the whole carnage in the first place if Revelation tells us God makes all things new and there is no death, why didn't he do that at the beginning? Is evolution making sense? Or is it compatible with what we believe in? What type of a God would do that? And what about these texts? These are very important texts for us. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15:52. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What's Paul telling us? Obviously, to recreate somebody that has already died and what I'm trying to make a point here is it's easy, it would probably be easier to create somebody with no memories, right? Than to recreate somebody who's got a past history. Arguably that's more difficult. Right? Because you got to get all the nerves and all the memories intact. To Paul this is not a problem for Christ. In the evolutionary model, you've got only two, comp two, pro two th ways of going with this. Christ is either unwilling or unable to create. 
Why didn't he do it with Adam and Eve in the first place if he can do it at the end? So let's think this through carefully, okay? Because there's profound implications for this. And if we follow these th this thinking through, it becomes almost impossible to buy certain things. Assume Paul's description is correct, the resurrections that we've just revealed. Assume Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and to forever, Hebrews 13.8, okay? So we've got a resurrection picture, and we've got Jesus is the same. And assume he has all knowledge and power. These are biblical texts. Then surely he had the power to make Adam and Eve from nothing in the beginning. Why would he use a long, protracted process with death? If Christ does not have this power to resurrect us, Paul's depiction of the resurrection is wrong. Now, as Adventists, I want you to listen to the next one. In either case, if we have a less than loving God or no resurrection, the evolutionary view destroys one of the central pillars in our Adventist tent, doesn't it? Are you with me? We got more. How do we deal with free will? Now, science will tell you no such thing. It's an illusion. You do not have free will. You just think you do. Why? Because everything's determined by chemical reactions. Those of you that have had chemistry know one simple thing. You put the same reactants in the beginning, chemicals have no free will. Right? You put the same reactants, you get the same products every time. It's the laws of chemistry. So, explaining moral accountability by the laws of physics or chemistry fails. So how do you get choice from this model? The biblical evolutionists explain, how do they explain this problem? Francis Collins, I'm sure some of you have read this book, The Language of God, has God implant a soul into all humanity at some point. This is getting cumbersome, people. But that's what he believes. Let's ask him some questions on this, okay? Because if you're going to implant souls into somebody, the Bible says all have sinned. Whoops, now we got a problem, okay? So we can only come up with two conclusions. Either God implanted defective souls, or... He had mass rebellion at some point after he had input those souls in there, right? That's the only way you can get that statement in Romans to be true on an evolutionary model. For God to be without reproach, in other words, when you read those texts, every knee will bow. For God to be without reproach in the sin problem, he must put a perfectly functioning system into man, as in the Garden of Eden story. Because any other way of looking at it, folks, makes him ultimately behind it at some point. Because evolutionary creation does not believe in the Genesis account, explanation for free will falls short. You can't find a way to make chemical pathways that have been selected for come up with a free will concept. So we get to another problem. What if there's no free will? Let's go. We're done. 
Now, let's get, let's get back to the question. These things are deci- divisive. If the, is, is the tent large enough? All right, this is getting to be a problem. Let's back up a minute. It's, we disagree, obviously. So let's agree to say God made us, okay? Let's just let's start moving to some different perspective because what we've discussed so far is incompatible with each other. Let's agree to say God made us by special creation or eh, to some degree by evolution. But the fact that Jesus rose from the grave two million years ago stands. Agreed? We can agree on that, can we not? The evolutionary Christians and the... Right? It's our new banner. Christ risen. We can all march forward to the new sunlit Christian era. I was going to do my Churchill impression. It's a theme all of us can gather or rally around. Is this correct? Do you agree with this? Let's forget how we got here. Let the debate on origins sort itself out in the fullness of time or at the appropriate juncture. That's diplomatic talk for let's just bury it, okay? You knew I was going to do this, didn't you? Just got one little problem. The same science that developed the evolutionary model also states there's no evidence resurrection has occurred or ever will occur. As a person in the medical profession, I agree with that statement. From what every scientific evidence I've seen, I've never seen anybody resurrected. Now, what I believe spiritually is different. But from a scientific standpoint at work, I've never seen this. So I have to, this, we've got a problem. What, what about healing, you're asking? Say again? But that's not resurrection. I'm talking about somebody coming back from the dead. Science says there's no resurrection. We've never seen it. Once you're dead, you're dead. So what happened to the rallying point? Creationists are cues of cherry picking. In other words, we'll take certain scientific evidence, but we'll disregard the rest. All right? I have a question for you. Aren't they doing the same thing? Aren't the evolutionists or the theistic evolutionists doing the same thing? Aren't they cherry picking the idea of resurrection when science says it doesn't occur? So we're hanging on to our favorite little belief here, but we're disregarding most of the evidence, right? Is this compatible from a scientific point of view? If you propose to use science, then use it. But don't cherry pick the idea of, evo- uh, of, of, of a resurrection. You see where I'm going with this? It creates a problem. If the biblical accounts of the resurrection are false, the tent question and the tent are done. If there's no resurrection, like science says, we're finished. And there's biblical proof for that. And if Christ be not risen, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Let's just assume, for the point of discussion, that science would allow it. Let's just, let's just tweak this a little bit and see where we're going, okay? Suppose science says, okay, that's something we can't talk about, but yeah, it's, I suppose it's theoretically possible. Suppose they allow for Christ's resurrection. We just got one more question to ask. Which Christ arose? The evolutionary one? or the creation one, because they're both different. One, you can rely on what he says. The other one uses, you can't really count on everything that's said in his revelation to us as being accurate.
seems that we've come full circle. The questions that we are raising about the character of God, isn't that what started this mess in the whole first place? Did God really mean what he said? The character of God is on trial here, and exactly who God is, these are the most important questions. How one characterizes God is important the creationist or the evolutionist. They're vastly different people. I don't see how we can get around this. How one reads the Bible, literal or its allegory or critical, but not the tent size. Why? Why is it not important how big the tent is? And I'm going to submit to you because it's been a two-tent model all along. I don't see them as being compatible. This phrase is fascinating to me. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And it's mentioned three times in the Bible. And it's not mentioned as a statement. It's mentioned as a question. Why would God do that? Why wouldn't he just say, nothing's too hard for me? Why does he ask us it? Why is the Holy, what's the Holy Spirit trying to get us to think about here? Genesis 18, 14. I'm just going to go back to that one for a minute. Jesus and the angels come and visit Abraham in the form of humans. Tells Abraham he's going to have a son, Sarah Snickers. She's 90 years or close to 90 years old. And Abraham ain't any younger and she's thinking, ha, this is impossible. And this is God's res- Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Jeremiah, he's talking. Ah, Lord, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. God answers him a little while later, ten verses actually. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I believe, and these are my own, I'm going to show you my own personal opinions about science, okay? Okay. I'm going to show you where I think everybody's making a huge mistake. My passion is genetics. And Bob and I have been on this journey for 10 years now. They're making, in the evolutionary model, they're making two big mistakes. Number one, in cosmology or in the study of the universe, they, the model that they currently have is that planets form by gravity. In other words, you get a collection of mass, it attracts more because of the gravitational pull, and you finally build up over billions of years a planet. You see where I'm going with that? That's the model. That's why they're saying we have a long, long, long time, because for a planet to form, it takes billions of years for it to finally attract enough particles and become big enough like the Earth, right? The problem with this is the Big Bang Theory. There's some problems between it. Now, follow me carefully when I explain this to you. In the Big Bang, everything starts from an infinitesimally small point and explodes out in all directions. Okay? Here's the problem. For something to form a slight or even seed of gravity coming together, you've got to do it quick because those boys, the rest of the boys, are flying past you at lightning speed. It's gonna, you've got to grab it quick because everything's moving out instantaneously. So for you to get enough mass to form a galaxy or a planet, you've got to do it. You've got to work quickly because the mass is headed out, and it's still headed out according to that model. You see the problem with that? 
how is stuff here? So the gravitational model of cosmology is a problem, and they know it. And geology timescales, I'm going to show you something in the Bible that is going to make you raise an eyebrow. Okay, I am going to point out something to you that is not yet totally proven. Okay, in other words, you know how an old scientific theory dies, right? One science funeral, one scientist's funeral at a time. It's the young guys that bring in the new theories and the old geezers like myself have to fade away before the new the scientific theories come in. There is one that's making inroads right now. I'm going to tell you this right now. It's called plasma cosmology, okay? Here's the thing. 99.999% of everything you see in the universe is in the form of plasma. What's plasma, you say? It's a fourth state of matter. Matter, as we know, can exist in a solid, it can exist in a gas, it can exist in a liquid. Plasma is another state. And what this means is the nuclei are jumbled around and the electrons are flowing. In most cases, it's a very hot scenario, exceedingly hot scenario. All right. Let me ask you this question. If 99.99% of everything we see out there is plasma, shouldn't we be looking at that? If the majority of what we're seeing is plasma, shouldn't we be studying plasma? It gets more interesting. By the way, you know those northern lights that you see? That's plasma. Thus saith the Redeemer, the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretched forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. I have made the heavens, that's Isaiah 44, 24, I have made the heavens and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. What does that look like? Stretched out. That's, a, that's the Crab Nebula, which is so big and out there, you, we can't even imagine it. Okay? If, you, if I showed you the most recent map of the cosmos, according to what the 3D map, everything's interconnected. It just looks like something spread out. Okay? Now, that's not scientific proof. I'm not claiming that it is. But I want you to look at this. See how everything's inter. There seems to be strands and stuff there. Do you see that? That's plasma. I'm going to give you a few more facts, and just stay with me here because I, if you see some of these things, we've got to do something different here. In plasma, filaments in which current flows, sorting of the ions of elements takes place. In other words, there's filaments in this plasma. Did you see something like filaments in that out there? Some little spicules connecting? It's plasma. What happens with that plasma is you get a current or you get a stream of this uh, uh, plasma and the elements sort themselves out in that stream. In other words, they sort themselves out according to how easy they ionize. In other words, if you give off your electrons easily, then you'll be towards the middle. If you don't give off your electrons very easily, like carbon or you know, some of the other ones, you're out towards the outside. So the atoms most easily ionized move to the center. Okay? The ones that are hardest to ionize move to the outside in this whole plasma stream that you see of all the atoms. And this is proven in a laboratory. This is called the Markland convection. You want to see what this looks like on a large plasma scale? There's the middle, the filament. What do you see? What's, what's Fe? Iron. 
Nit what's that? Nickel? Silicon? Magnesium? Sulfur? Carbon? Hydrogen? Oxygen? Nitrogen? Helium? Are you seeing anything here? Making any sense to you? Maybe the next shot will. So this is the longitudinal axis. This is the radius. They sort themselves out like that. All right? And these filaments we can see in science. And it's symmetrical. You see that? You, either way you look, it's the same. But the center has iron. Wh what's in the core of our Earth? So right up here, I'm going to show you something. There's our Earth right there. Okay? Iron nickel core. What, what did I just show you? If 99.9% .9 of everything we see in space is plasma, and plasma sorts itself out like that, is it possible God could use that to create instantaneously? Uh, well, let's look at the evidence. What else is out here on this model? You've got an iron nickel core. What's next? Rock silicates, right? Did you not see that on that example? On the surface, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, what are we? And helium further up in the gaseous phase? The problem with the gravitational model is some planets should not be where they are. And they admit it. But if you look at this model here, all of this makes sense. Is it possible? And I'm going to tell you one other little thing that will stun you here. How many of you have a boat or have ever seen a boat? You have a propeller? You ever seen propellers? What happens to propellers after a little while? They get pitted. Have you seen that? And it erodes away. Do you know what causes that? No, it's not you hitting the sandbar because you missteered the boat. What is it? Does anybody have any idea? Anybody know? OK, part of it. As the propeller turns, it creates a immediate vacuum in the water. And a plasma bubble pops out. Instantaneously, it creates or reacts to a sound, disappears, and it eats away. So plasma is what's causing that pitting in a propeller on a boat. It's a sound wave that does that. And if you decrease the sound or change the sound, you don't form the plasma. It changes the formation of that bubble. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? What did I just say? Sound? OK, I know where you're going with this. Calm down, Webster. You haven't had any sleep. You must be getting to. If sound can affect plasma, is it possible God could speak? OK, I know what somebody's going to say, but there's no atmosphere out there. But we're thinking of speech in our terms, right? When we have one example in the Bible where he came and talked to his people, what, what did it sound like to them? We're done. Lightning, shaking. One more thing. This is taken um, from a large array camera. Actually, it was a radio camera. This image shows a huge jet of current stretching for 150,000 light years across galaxy 3C303. The current model of how this stuff forms. And don't misunderstand me. There are some reputable scientists that are now ascribing plasma. But the current old geezer club still goes for the gravitational thing. The current idea of how these jets come out is that the black hole, the ultimate attractor, spins matter so fast that it ejects stuff out. Now, you can say that to a high school student. You can ask, tell him that this is the ultimate attractor. Even light does not come out of here. How can it possibly shoot stuff out when it decides to, if nothing else comes out of it? This makes no sense. You're talking about the ultimate attractor of everything, even light. Yet it can shoot stuff out 150,000 light years? Something's not making sense to my high school brain. 
The gravitational model is in trouble, and I'm telling you this. What does that do then to long ages of the universe? I'm going to recommend this website. I don't often do it. This is a Christian uh, gentleman from Australia who is now working in Oregon, and he runs a, a, a telescope up there. He um, has used to be a, a physics candidate for a PhD. His mother got... Uh, anyway, you can read all about his story. I find him to be the most... If you've got time to read or think, I find him... You, you will never run out of stuff on his website. I can spend hours there looking at stuff. But his, at the end of the day, he says there's enough evidence that God created the earth. You just got to look for it. In six days, like he said. So I'm going to leave that with him. Okay, one more thing. Quickly, let's go on to the geological record. All right? We all seen it. That big column, this formed so many million years ago. This formed so many million years ago. I just have one thing to ask. Second Peter 3, 3 to 7. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. At least they said creation. But listen to that phrase. For all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. One more time. All things continue as they were. In other words, day after day, everything's the same, right? That's what the geological column says. It takes this many millions of years for it to change. What's Peter say here? For this they are ignorant of that by the word of, the, of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What is that? whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. When I was a kid, I used to ask this question, why did God create earthquakes? I mean, how did they deal with it back then? And why would you create a tectonic plate that shifted every now and then and shook the inhabitants? What is, what is Peter telling us here? The earth standing out of the water and in the water. How can you be out of and in something at the same time? Anybody got any ideas? How can you be out of the water and in the water at the same time? When you're floating in the water, what are you? Part of you's out, part of you's in, right? I have no proof for this. I'm going to submit to you that, and there's evidence, hints at it in the Bible. I'm going to submit to you that the earth was nothing like it was now. There were no vast oceans, in my opinion. I think there was a cushion of non-compressible water underneath the earth. And I base this on this fact. If you consider that the crust, just the crust of this earth, is 10 to 16 miles thick, all right, 10 to 16 miles, it's still comparable to an eggshell on an egg. Now, what did God say in the beginning uh, when he said the Spirit of God hovered on the surface of the waters and what? But the dry land appeared, right? So is it possible God made a cushion of water underneath a thin 
crust and that something happened at the flood and that got crushed. And now what used to be in the water and on the water is now all over the place and on tectonic plates that cause earthquakes. And our, what, what, what happens to our geological column at this point? We're assuming everything's been the same. Oops, Paul talks about that. Don't assume everything's been the same day after day. Paul's giving us a warning in here that geologically things are different. They have not been going on slowly day after day. You buy that? How do we calibrate ge the genetic clock? Rocks and clocks. The genetic clock is calibrated by the fossil record or the geological record. How accurate are our genetic clocks if that's off? So when you read that we diverged from Neanderthals or Denisovians 40,000 years ago, they're basing it on the fossil record. If Paul's warning us, don't assume that's correct, Geolo geologically things were different, how accurate is this when you read this? Somebody got honest. Reading the entrails of chickens, <laughs> molecular timescales of evolution and the illusion of precision. And they rail against something here. They're saying, for example, on the basis of just 15 genes, we just looked at 15 genes, the arthropod nematode divergence events was calculated to have occurred 1,167 million years ago, okay, plus or minus 83. That's according to a paper that they were discussing, all right? Were calibration and derivation uncertainties taken into proper consideration, listen to what they're saying. This is how good the statistics are in some of the stuff. The 95% confidence interval would have turned out to be at least 40 times larger. We're talking 14.2 billion people. How, yet the, this comes out as scientifically proven I'm astounded at this. At least somebody got honest and criticized somebody else's study. This year, they published this book, Genetic Explanations. This is a clever pun for geneticists. Sense and Nonsense. It's edited by Sheldon Kaminsky. Krimsky. And he just edits. He writes one, one of the chapters and another uh, portion in the back. I love, this book sent me for a loop. This is the evolutionary people talking, all right? And they're discussing what mistakes we're making in the scientific literature, the lay press, everything. Here's what, just one quote from one of the chapters. Focusing on the transmission of genes, which is how we've done it. Okay, let's see how these genes change as we come down from our forebearers, the molds or whatever, focusing on the transmission of genes rather than on the transmission of phenotypes, how we look or how shape changes, that's what phenotype is, via developmental mechanisms led to, what are they calling it? An impoverished evolutionary theory? People, how can people say this is scientifically proven? Even they're admitting it's not. Don't be fooled. My favorite one of all. The great selling point of Wall Darwin Wallace theory was that it contained no hypothesis how matter arrived at the point of being subjected to selection. What's he saying here? For an organism in the evolutionary model to be selected, it has to be living it has to be reproducing. It has to be exposed to environment. They're saying the original evolutionary model was so successful because nobody took that into account. They didn't have to explain that. Are you with me? Listen to this. He gets honest. The origin of life is still a mystery as of 2012. 
So when you see in the paper a blog or somebody else lambasting those conservative Christians in Texas because they're trying to get creation into the evolutionary schools and they're so naive and ignorant, who's being a little judgmental here? Even they admit, there's no, we don't know how life got here. The next statement is the best. The scandalous obscurity of the foundational process of biology, what that's saying is, it's a scandal that we don't know how life began. Hardly, this process hardly rattles the dismissive self-assurance of the gene-centric modern synthesizers. This is one of their boys talking. He's hammering them. This is the knockout punch right there. If you can't explain how life got here, it's scandalous, and we still don't know. Do not think that I accuse you to the Father. This is a conversation taking place in John 5. He's healed somebody on the Sabbath. This is at the unnamed feast of the Jews. He's healed somebody on the Sabbath. The boys are after him. You can't do that on the Sabbath. And now he's engaged in conversation with them. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, he says to them. In whom ye trust. The Jewish idea back then was if you were a genetic descendant of Moses, you were saved. You were a Jew. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. If that's a math equation, what's that saying? Equal. For he did what? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Wait. The archaeologists say there is no evidence of writing. And the current understanding of the, cor the collection of the first five books was done in Babylon when because it was all oral up until that point. But they decided they didn't want to lose their national identity, so the rabbis got together and wrote down the first five books. What, what did Jesus say? Who wrote of him? If I had read this, Years ago, when somebody hit me broadside with the documentary hypothesis, it would have been a lot nicer. Listen to this. Listen to the rest of it. But if ye believe not his writings, what are, what are Moses' writings? First five books? Genesis? No. If ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Guys, this is huge. You know what this is saying? If you call Genesis a myth or you don't believe it, you're not going to believe what he says. What does this do to the documentary hypothesis of Wellhausen, you know, the priestly, the Yahwist, and how they got collated together in Babylon? What is this saying about that? Toss it out. We're done. Our boss has personally endorsed Genesis as being written by who? We're done. And he's added a little caveat. If you don't believe it, you're going to have a hard time believing what I tell you. Yes, you had a question. Well, it's all a myth. We don't have any Ten Commandments. It's all a myth. That's what they're saying. Do you see what I'm saying? No, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm, on, I'm in the camp. The, right. And I, I like, there's a guy named Chuck Missler. I like what he says a whole lot. If you don't believe this text, you've got a lot bigger problems than who wrote Moses or who wrote Genesis. Do you see what I'm saying? If you don't believe what he's saying here, you've got bigger problems. 
thank you very much. Um, next week, Bob will be back, and um, he'll be talking on the next lecture, which will be the Ten Commandments, which I think you'll find interesting from a scientific point of view.